ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. Good evening. I'm calling to order this meeting of the Arlington Select Board on June 24th, 2024. I'm Select Board Chair Steve DeCourcy. Tonight's meeting is being conducted in a hybrid format consistent with provisions in state law for remote participation in public meetings. Before we begin, please note the following. This meeting is being conducted in the Select Board chambers and over Zoom. It is being recorded and simultaneously broadcasted on ACMI. People wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. People participating either in person or by Zoom are reminded that you may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, we ask you to provide your full name and place of residence in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials found on the town's website, specifically the select board agendas and minutes page. If technical difficulties sever the remote connection to one or more participants and efforts to reconnect within a reasonable period of time fail, the in-person meeting will continue at the discretion of the chair provided that a quorum of the board is physically present. Zoom participants are encouraged to retain the phone number provided in their confirmation email for a backup audio connection to the meeting. There will be an opportunity for public comment at tonight's meeting during open forum. If you are attending by Zoom and want to participate, please raise your hand when I announce that public comment is open. This is our last meeting of fiscal year 2024. Let's see how much of the town's business we can get done tonight. Uh, moving along to item two is our fiscal 24 third quarter financial report. Ida Cody, our comptroller. And for those of you at home, our third quarter for the town runs from January 1 through March 31. 2024. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Cody. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Good evening. Ida Cody, Town Controller. So I'm here to present the year-to-date budget report for the third quarter. Um, I'm going to try to give you a brief summary of this 50-page report. Um, I will start, though, by telling you that we have a change. You probably noticed that in this report, uh, we recently had a conversion of our chart of accounts. Prior to this, we used to, we couldn't really generate a summary report, so we had to export all the data, put it on an Excel spreadsheet, uh, insert formulas, pivot, and VLOOKUP to create a nice summary report for you that matches the detailed report. Now, with the new system, we can generate these reports directly from Munis, and, and I know Ms. Mahan likes to see them directly not being touched by us. So um, I think this eliminates the room for error, saves time, and I think it looks pretty. I hope you find it useful too. Um, I'm going to dive into the general fund expenses. Um, straightforward, most departments are at the 75%. Few exceptions. Um, one is the FinCom. They underspend their budget because their stipends are getting paid in June. The legal department is at 90% because we had a large settlement in January for which we have already received a reserve fund transfer. Facilities is at 92% and this is mostly because of the increase, the significant increase, about 40% in the cost of the electricity. We've already received a reserve fund of $115,000. And the pensions are spent 100% because we transferred the retirement appropriation to the state uh, on July 1st. Articles, you will see that the burn rate is all over the place because uh, the, the, these appropriations can be spent within two years. So some of them are at 10%, some of them are 90%, depends, depending on when the commissions send us the invoices. I will make a mention, though, that the collective bargaining, uh, we budgeted and we never spent it out of this account. When the union settlements, um, when the union negotiations are settled, we move the budget, not we don't spend directly. So we pay the, the people from the departments where they live. General fund, um, overall collection is at 81%. Um, most uh, um, categories are over 90%. We were fortunate to continue to have a conservative estimate this, uh, this fiscal year, which will contribute to the bottom line and increase free cash. 
I will just talk about the ones that jumped 100%. The, in the category other excise, which is at 113%, is included the hotel at um, 144% and the meals tax at 118. We suspect that this is because of the increase in the prices. Marijuana, on the other hand, it didn't hit the projection, is at 68, not at 75, but we did increase the projection by 70% by $70,000 this year. Pilot, which stays for uh, payment in lieu of taxes, is at 113%. This is because the town owned a property, a piece of property. We sold it in November, for which we didn't have um, a tax bill issued. Uh, when they sold, the, sold the, the property, we issued a pro rata tax and we deposited into this account. Um, the, the fees are at 124% uh, due to the uh, increases in the, in the rates for the ambulance fees. And also the host community agreement uh, doesn't have an estimate, DOR doesn't allow us to project it on the tax recap. Therefore, this just, as it comes in, goes to the free cash. License and permits. Again, a good year, 158%. Uh, this is mostly because of the a large um, project at 1025 Mass Avenue. We had a 50, 50 residential and one commercial, and the prices are, the cost is based on the total cost of the project. Uh, we charge 2% for building and 3% for wires. Lastly, the elephant, the in interest income um, is 1,000. 295,000, uh, 95%. I'll explain this. <laughs> this is a combination of several factors. First of all, we had a very, very conservative estimate. It was $200,000, which we doubled in fiscal year 25. Also, we had very good rates. Our treasurer negotiated with the, with the banks, and we got as much as even 5, 5.3%. And we also had large amounts of cash in the capital projects, mostly from um, the high school and the DPW. And uh, the last is the enterprise funds. Uh, they're all in pace to um, meet their budgets. I will just mention that the RIC and the REC are at, a RIC is a 90% collection and the REC is at 109. Um, we have higher revenue because um, there's huge demand and the rec uh, director kept, keeps introducing new programs. Um, that's all I have from my presentation. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Great. Thank, thank you, Ms. Cody. And I'll turn to board members for any questions or comments. Uh, Mr. Dickens. Well, I, I'll move for seat, you know, and I'm now trying to wrap my brain around the, the the format, you know. Hey, I know that you, you usually presented all that we see here, hey, but I rarely would delve into the munis part of it, you know. And so, just to help me understand what I'm seeing, for instance, on the the line for, I think it's planning, you know, um, it has original appropriation 860, I mean 834, and then transfer adjustment minus 180. So, and then the. Stop. So I'm just trying to understand mm -hmm. what, what is that, you know? I don't have, go ahead. Yeah, these are the salaries. So when you vote it, we vote the gross budget, right? Yeah. But included in this planning, we also have people who are getting paid out of CDBG. Yeah. So we need to pull them out because otherwise their budget would be overstated. Okay. It's an offset, so we need to remove it. Okay. And also where you see an increase, it's a carry forward from the prior year. Okay. All right. That's my question. So now I understand the rest of those. And so, okay, great, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Diggins. And Mrs. Mahan. And I will second Mr. Diggins' motion. Um, and I, I do want to say thank you for, um, we now have it in Munis, from Munis. I, I think it's also more effective and efficient in, in terms of doing the jobs. And um, not that I was casting aspersions on you or any of your current staff, um, but the, process before of getting it, pulling it into an Excel worksheet, that famous type over key, we won't go into it, um, kind of gave me a lot of headaches. So, um, but that won't happen anymore. And, and as you said, I think it makes the job easier not having to add two, like two extra steps. Um, so I do appreciate that. And, I, and it's much easier for me to cross reference. And this question I will only ask once, um, only because um, 
coming from Mr. Pooler in this report previously, but um, I do appreciate that we do have the uh, balance of municipal building stabilization and override uh, stabilization um, as of June 2024. I'm only asking this question once and I won't ask it again. These are actual, um, either the comptroller and or town manager, these are as close as you can get actual figures of what are in those three. Mr. Feeney? If I could, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Those are actual figures as of the writing of this report. With respect to the override stabilization fund though, that number would be slightly understated because there's a lag in reconciliation of our bank accounts. So there is interest that still remains to be uh, posted and taken from the bank account and transferred uh, into the override stabilization fund as attributable to the override stabilization fund. So this is in fact the balance of that account as you would read it, but uh, in fact there's, there will ultimately be more money in there once we complete reconciliation for the spring months. And so we'll probably see that in the fourth quarter. Oh, definitely. It will be reflected in the fourth quarter. Okay, and then um, I, I don't see it in here. And like, just as an example, thank you for the backup data, data the way it is, because like when you see fines and forfeitures and you see the percentage associated with that, it looks like we're going to have a big windfall. But then if you look at the backup data, we're talking about ten or $12,000, right. which is still a lot of money, penny, nickels, dimes, quarters. Um, but... But that's one of the reasons it kind of saves me a question on that. So that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, any questions? Go. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you, Ms. Cody. I, I, and again, thank you for the updated balances. I did note that I took a look at the Finance Committee report at town meeting and the stabilization fund, the override stabilization fund, I think was in the range of $17.9 million. So you can see the growth just in the, in the last few months, and it's really helpful. Um, to see those current balances, as, as Mrs. Mahan said. And, and I also want to thank you for the additional detail on the, uh, the pro rata tax there. That was a, uh, an issue that we had dealt with here on the board, and it's strong coordination between the, the assessors, yourself, and the treasurer, because there's really no time limit to send that pro rata bill, but better to send it as soon as possible. And I'm glad that it was sent to the new owner, and it looks like it's been collected. So thank you for the information. We look forward later this year to the... Um, End of year report. Sure. Great. Okay, so on a motion to receive from Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mrs. Mahan. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you for joining Thank us you. tonight. Thank you. Right, next is a item three is an update to the CDBG program year 50 budget. Our community development block grant administrator, Mary Musinski, is here with, I think, some good news on some. Yes adjustments and uh, maybe some additional funds that are available to some of the applicants. Correct. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Well, good evening. Thank you for uh, your time tonight. Uh, I'm Mary Musinski, the Community Development Block Grant Administrator, and I'll be presenting the CDBG subcommittee's updated budget, budget recommendations for program year 50 for 2024 through 2025. Um, so the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development announced on May 8th Eighth, that Arlington <coughs> CDBG program was allocated just over $1,059,000 for the upcoming year. Arlington's allocation is $58,000 more than originally budgeted. Uh, the CDBG subcommittee reconvened on May 29th to adjust the CDBG program budget accordingly. It was recommended that funding for the following projects be increased while keeping um, the budget within statutory spending limits for public services and planning. <coughs> um, so the following for public services, um, Arlington Eats Food Market um, <coughs> received an increase. Uh, for infrastructure projects, there's a lower mill brook flood resistance design green infrastructure project. Um, also the Department of Public Works ADA accessible sidewalk curb ramp installations received an increase. And then planning, uh, planning studies was increased um, to help fund the, especially uh, Arlington's master plan update, which is just, just uh, started. The subcommittee also approved reprogramming unexpended funds from previous years, public facilities and infrastructure projects. 
These funds were not expended for many reasons, including costs being lower, lower than expected, budget changes, and because the project was canceled. When this happens, the funds become available for reprogramming to new or existing activities with statu within statutory spending limits. There are currently two requests for funding that meet the CDBG objectives and that are nearly ready to begin work. The first one is DPW's ADA accessible sidewalk curb ramp installations, and that um, would total $125,000 for work at additional locations. Um, and this will require reprogramming $100,000 that remains after completing the Whittemore Park ADA improvements project and $25,000 uh, from a canceled 2022 Minuteman to Mystic design project. Uh, according to the CDBG Citizen Participation Guide, reprogramming funds at this amount requires a substantial amendment to the CDBG Annual Action Plan. The substantial amendment and Program Year 50 Draft Annual Action Plan are both available for review on the CDBG homepage. Uh, both plans are also open for public comment through July 8th. And any public comment, whether written or you know, emailed, what would go to me and my email address is also available on the CDBG page. I will not spell it for you. <laughs> um, the second project is also an ADA accessibility project. It's a sidewalk brick repair at Town Hall, totaling $65,000. Um, these funds are available because Town Hall, Robbins Memorial Flagstaff Plaza, ADA accessibility project was completed under budget. Uh, this change is not large enough to trigger a substantial amendment. So in this case, the CDBG subcommittee's May 29th approval is the necessary endorsement. So again, I'd like to thank the CDBG subcommittee members, including Mrs. Mahan, Mr. Hurd, and Mr. Feeney, who made the um, difficult budgeting decisions for the upcoming CDBG program year. And at this time, I'd like to request the select board and town manager approve the updated CDBG budget, including the substantial amendment for program year 50. Thank you. Great, thank, thank, thank you very and much. Of course, if thank you have any questions. Before I, I turn it to board members, and thank you for the table at the end, and you, you ran through the um, all four categories of increased funding, and, and I just had the original CDBG reports. Arlington Eats was zero, now it's 7928, 7928. Oh, for Arlington Eats, yes, correct. Um, the two public facilities jobs, the Lower Mill Brook was 150,000, now it's 175,000. Correct. The ADA curb ramp installation was 100,000, now it's 113,000. And the planning studies is roughly a $12,000 increase from 50,000 to 61,904. Yes. And, and uh, that report was part of the town meeting package and, and uh, that town meeting endorsed, but we had vote pre voted previously. So with that, I will turn to one of the two CDBG subcommittee members. And I will start with Mr. Hurd. <laughs> Move approval. Um, Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Yeah, the I know at town meeting the Arlington Eats zero um, grant would raise a couple of high eyebrows, and seven thousand nine twenty eight seems a little odd. So I mean, this year initially we thought we were going to have a much lower number, um, and we had to make a lot of cuts in the first before we got the higher numbers that came in. A lot of these public service categories that are have a statutory limit are actually lower than they requested because we had to make cuts and at that time we just couldn't give anything to Arlington Eats for their uh, request just because it would have caused, it would essentially eliminate some of the other programs. So we were very happy when this came in to have an opportunity and we, when this, the additional funds came in, that 7928 is essentially all the money that we could give to public service. So we gave them everything that we didn't increase any other categories. We just gave it all to Arlington Eats because it's an amazing um, entity that I've been involved with in the past. So we're happy to do it. Um, and then again, some of the other projects, we just kind of went as demand. We would get the most bang for our buck. You know, curb ramp installations. The more money we do it, the more curb ramps we do. So. Um, I think the numbers came in good. It was a good result to find out we had more money. So happy to support this. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Mm, I will definitely second that and um, just repeat my remarks from the subcommittee meeting. Um, I, I, I do want to thank Ms. Mazinski 
um, for not only all the work that you do um, in your role as um, overseeing CDBG, but um, with the extra meetings, first with COVID-19 and other things, and now with um, this money that came in, and you've really streamlined the process as well as um, you have to provide a, a sort of inordinate amount of information um, to the subcommittee members and really does it in an extremely organized and as easy as possible way to um, go through and, and uh, read the documents that you need to see and gain understanding of it with a somewhat larger, large size committee. So um, I, I do want to thank you for, um, I know it's your job, but <laughs> you do your job very well. So thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, any other comments or questions? Okay. Seeing none. Okay, so on a motion by Mr. Hurd, second by Mrs. Mahan, this is one of the unique votes that we have. So when I call for the vote, the town manager also votes along with us. So all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, it is a unanimous vote. And thank you for the good news and for all the work that you've done uh, on the CDBG subcommittee. Thank you very much. Sure. Right, next is the consent agenda. We have a number of items. Item four, 4th of July banners. Uh, item five is appointment to the Public Memorial Committee, Eugene O'Neill. Item six are reappointments to the Arlington Historic District Commissions, Beth Cohen, Stephen Makauka, and Carol T. Item seven is Arlington International Film Festival banners approval. Item eight is a request for a contractor drain layer license for New England Drilling and Rock Splitting Corp. Item nine is a request for a special one-day beer and wine license for June 27th, July 11th, July 25th, August 8th, and August 22nd at the Arlington Reservoir for a Thursday night concert series by Matt Guernsey. Item 10 is a request for a special one-day beer and wine license on August 25th, 2024 at the Arlington Reservoir for the Arlington Recreation Reservoir Dogs event, Matt Guernsey. Item 11 is a request for a special one-day beer and wine license for July 6th, July 13th, July 20th, and July 27th at the Jason Russell House for a beer garden, Robert Brazil, president of the Arlington Historical Society, and Sarah Lundberg, director of the Arlington Historical Society. Um, turn to members. Mr. Helmuth. I'd like to move approval. I do have a question about one of the items. Certainly. Um, just on for item nine, uh, the special one day, one day uh, beer and wine licenses by uh, Arlington Brewing Company. I recall that at a prior meeting a few months ago that we we thought that the, the uh, applicant was uh, nearing or, or might might near the uh, the maximum number of these that they were allowed. Um, so I just want to check with the with the chair. Um, if that just to make sure we've done our due diligence on that. Yeah, sure. We thank you, Mr. Allen. Yeah, and Ms. Meyer and I have discussed that, and um, they have not hit, or he has not hit his 30 days uh, when he came before us last year. What we thought is, if this continues, he would hit it in the fall if he was looking to do um, the programming up at Roasted Granola. Mm -hmm. But it, with these number of approvals, he will not hit the 30-day limit. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Second. Um, okay, second by Ms. Mahan. Any other comments? Okay, so a motion for approval of the consent agenda by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mrs. Mahan. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Uh, item 12 is an appointment for the Commission for Arts and Culture, and Jessica Chow for a term to expire January 31st, 2026. Uh, is she with us this evening? Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. Yeah. Uh, welcome. If if you could um, just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your uh, interest in being on the commission for arts and culture. Oh yes. Um, I'm Jessica Chow. And I'm really honored to be considered for an appointment to the Arlington Commission for Arts and Culture. I have both experience as a past performing artist and a manager of arts nonprofits and philanthropies. 
And I'd like to use that experience on behalf of Arlington's cultural community and residents. Um, I truly believe that arts bring joy and improve the quality of life that, of all that they touch. And um, I've been a resident now for almost four years in Arlington, and I've become so impressed with the range of all the public arts and live arts performances that the town offers. I'm really impressed by the growing business community that has been partnering our artists, and I hope to deepen those relationships as I learn more about what the residents truly, uh, what their true interests are. Um, I'm interested in all the residents, elders, parents, children, um, and young professionals. Um, although my primary experience comes from New York City, I've worked on a national scale, so I've become familiar with um, how vibrant uh, local communities grow even more vibrant, and I want to become a part of Arlington's future. I have to say, in the short time that I've lived here, I've fallen in love with the town. Well, well thank you, and, and, and thank you for, for your interest. Uh, I will turn to board members. Mr. Diggins. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. May I like to move approval of, uh, of her appointment? Thank you. Second. Mr. Hurd, any other comments? Okay. So the comments I will, sure. I'll add. I mean, I'm truly impressed by you know, um, your qualifications. I mean, uh, as you said, you're you're an artist, but I mean, your your fundraising capabilities are really pretty impressive. I mean, and so uh, you're going to be a real asset. I mean, to ACAC and and I mean, um, and I and. I, ACAC, I mean, I love ACAC too. I mean, and so I look forward to you know, um, working with you. You know, I mean, not as a fundraiser, but just as a collaborator on on the projects mm -hmm. that they do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. And yeah, now this I was very impressed with your background. And, and one of the uh, uh, areas of experience that really stood out to me was your experience with PBS <laughs> a long while ago. Yes. But. Uh, anyway, well, thank you. So we have a motion for approval by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor say aye. 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 Good, congratulations, and, and thank you again. Thank you. All right. Item 13 is an appointment to the LGBTQIA plus Rainbow Commission, Sarah Goodrich, for a term to expire January 31, 2026. Ms. Goodrich, I believe, is joining us by Zoom. I'll just ask if they're under a different name to raise their hand, so I know who should vote. Nothing? No. Okay. Um, typically, for the first-time appointments, we do ask that the, the um, individual come join us, um, unless the member has, has had a particular interview. So. I think for this, maybe a motion to table it. Um, we can put it aside until later, but maybe a motion to table would be appropriate. So moved. Okay. Thank you. Second. Okay. So a motion to table by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor? Aye. 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 Item 14, uh, Council on Aging appointment, Jim Munsey, for a term to expire June 30th, 2026. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Come on up. Yes, yeah, sit right there, Mr. Munsey. I see one familiar face over here since the last time I went through this. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you again. Nice to see you. Yeah. So, yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself. We did see some of the materials, and I know you had served previously on the, uh, yes. on the council. I had two three-year terms previously, and I was lucky to be with the group that asked the town to take the old senior center and turn it into some place you really want to go to and function beautifully. And it was well worth the efforts and the presentations that I put together and you people listened and you did the job. And I see now that there's so many openings on the board, I said, maybe I can help. I don't have anything particular that I want to bark about, but I'm sure that'll change. <laughs> great, great, thank you. All right, I uh, turn to board members and Mrs. Mahan. First, I'd like to uh, move approval on Mr. Muncy's appointment. I'm thrilled to see that um, you'll be reintegrating yourself, although you're kind of there already with the transportation end of the, of the council. I was going to bring that up. Um, 
one of the things that I, I do is I'm a part-time driver for the Council on Aging with the van. And I meet so many people who are so appreciative of what the town does for them, transportation not being the only thing. Arlington Eats is one of them. Um, you, you can't tell people like yourselves how much they really appreciate how much the town does. And granted, I'm mostly dealing with people 60 and over, but they're almost 25% of the population in the town. So there's a big need there, and you people help make sure they get what they need. Thank you. And thanks to Mr. Muncie, you're one of our best stewards that we can send in our, in our place, in our steed, um, uh, to, to do something like that. And I do appreciate what you've done for us in this program in the past and what you're now going to do again yeah, in the we'll present and the future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. I would gladly second that and just say thank you, sir, for your service to our country and to your community. I think that speaks to uh, your philosophy of life, which is to serve others and to be part of uh, part of your community. And I can't think of a better picture of Arlington. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so I'll just say, too, the credit for all that happens, you know, that in this town really goes to to, to Mr. Feeney and the rest of the staff. We, we approve things, me, but they executed. So so that's where the real credit goes. And even though you said that you think that your um, resume would not be useful, uh, <laughs> as someone who's really curious, because I learn a lot, you know, from people's you know, resumes, like me, you know, it's like, People have things in their resumes that I didn't even know existed, you know. Uh, so, 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 if at some point you want to send it to us, I mean, I'd appreciate reading it. But clearly, it's not necessary. And as people said, I mean, you're coming back, and that says a lot about the council on aging, you know, because because if it weren't worth your while, I'm sure you wouldn't do it. I mean, sure. so, so that says a lot about them too. So, thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you for, for for coming back. I think it's great. The information you'll pick up while driving the van will be helpful for the for the council. Um, your, your position as the liaison was started because the group that I was with said, we need a, a liaison here from the select board. And um, Joe Curro was the first one. That's right. Uh, he was fantastic for us and opened our eyes and minds to limits and possibilities. Right. right. So, yeah, no, and I've, I've truly enjoyed that. I haven't, I haven't had the attendance record that Mr. Carroll had, admittedly, <laughs> as a liaison, but I've really enjoyed it and look forward to, to serving, uh, attending the meetings with you. So, uh, on a motion for approval by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Helmuth. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Thank you again, Mr. Munson. Thank you very much. You. Okay. Item 15 for approval food, food vendor, Namaste Spice. 159 Massachusetts Avenue, and the applicant is joining us um, by Zoom, I believe, this evening. Oh, hello. Good evening. Hi, yeah, if you could just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the, uh, the business and the application. Uh, of course. Um, so, hey, my, my name is Pravin, and this is my mom, Juna Tamang. Uh, she is the owner of the restaurant, and I'm just the manager of the restaurant. Um, and as far as the business itself goes, it's an Indian restaurant. It used to be Anthony's Eastside Deli at this location. Uh, we recently decided to purchase this uh, uh, restaurant because we have seen, so essentially the idea is we want to provide an Indian restaurant at the east side of the Arlington, which we believe is missing. We, we see there is a couple of uh, Indian restaurants more to the west side, such as Punjab or the new uh, newly restaurant that just came about. I, I can't remember remember the name on top of my head, unfortunately. But um, other than that, what one of the other thing, one of the main reason we chose this specific location is because oh, even during our time of purchasing the, uh, purchasing the actual restaurant, we see a lot of, uh, a lot of folks just come to us and say, hey, when are you guys opening? Are you guys opening soon? You know, they had a, I just like the community that they have here. They keep asking, they, uh, when are we opening? I really, I just wanted to, we, that's why we wanted to open a restaurant here. Um, yeah. Great. Great. Well, thank, thank you for the materials that you presented and, and uh, for providing the menu. And I will turn to board members for any <laughs> questions, motions, comments. Mrs. Mahan. Uh, for, first, I'd like to uh, move approval and um, say um, thank you to Mr. Is it Tremong? Tremong? Your mom? Yes. Um, and your mom. Good to see mom there. Um, and I do know in terms of the restaurant business, it, it's a business that requires long hours and 
your actual family a lot of the time. So um, I do appreciate uh, you taking a chance coming here in Arlington. And I just have one question, and the question isn't, it, it's just um, sort of a housekeeping thing. Um, and it's not saying you, there's something you should or should not do, but I just want to double check that um, what you're requesting are hours from Monday through Saturday, so you'll be closed on Sunday, or did you want to also include Sunday? Uh, I apologize if that's a typo, but we, uh, our actual plan was to open from, um, so we plan on having a day off on Tuesday, but open on every other day. So we just, uh, one day off and rest of the week uh, open. Um, I, I, excuse me, Smart. I, I almost think just for purposes of the, of the application, you can decide what day you're, you're open, but probably better off to include every day. I right. think that's what you're getting at. Yes, yes. So, so if it's all right with you, we can amend that administratively to Sunday through Saturday, and then you decide to close Tuesdays, that's fine, but you don't want to have to come back to us if you change your mind if we omitted a day. Understood. No, that sounds great. Okay. Thank you. Okay? I, I just wanted, for, for that very reason, if, you know, you may... I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So that's it. Move thank approval. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Second. Uh, okay, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Any... So, as, um, Mr. Diggins? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So as, as someone who lives in East Arlington, you know, uh, I've been wondering when you're going to open, too. I didn't ask, you know, but, but that is the nature of the, the folks in the East. I mean, we, we just love our diverse, uh, diverse res restaurants, I mean, and you're, you're going to add to that. I also see that you're um, going to compete with Quillos on the smoothies, I mean, so I look forward to trying your smoothies, too. Um, and I will have I mean, some comments maybe after we approve this, you know, in, in general. I mean, so, sure. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Okay. All right, so on a motion for approval by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. It's, the application has been approved, but Mr. Diggins would like to add a few comments. So. Yes, it's not, it's, it's not important for the requesters to stay. You know? so, I mean, so, so if you want to you go, you can, so it's more kind of okay. internal. You know? So, so um, just a minor thing on, I, I noticed like there was a, a 159 and 189 on some of them, so I think we need to do maybe a little administrative correction on some of the, the um, applications, because one of them, I think, said, there, some said 159, some said oh, 189. Oh, yeah. All the address. Yeah, yeah, the address, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. so, so just some, I can find it for you if you want me, but it's not something to hold things up. And, um, and, and the other is maybe just to kind of understand a little better, I mean, about what folks are asked to present to us when it comes to, you know, things like, um, maintenance mean and and pest control because I notice there's a lot of variation in what we get in these and I don't know to what extent mean there's any request for more than we're getting mean and I don't know to what extent mean other parts of the, the the staff are getting more and we're only seeing a subset of it and the reason this comes up is that when we had the issue um, in in the heights mean with the pizza place I was I, I didn't like the sort of um, lack of detail for um, the cleaning policy, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so part of me was like, well, and I just seen a subset of what they're getting, what you're getting, in which case, I mean, why should I say anything more in the meeting? But, but if I'm seeing everything that's being, set, that's being sent, you know, then to certain, for some establishments, I feel that it's not be substantial enough, you know. Now, we don't want to overburden people with regulation, but at the same time, we kind of want to treat everyone the same way. So I just kind of want to get a better handle on that. I mean, and normally, uh, Mr. Feeney, this is something I bring up in our conversations, me, but I limit it to a half hour, so I'm going to use some of that time here to maybe find out I mean, what do we do, I mean, and if we need to do a little bit more to standardize things without being overburden some, that would be good, because I do take this part of the role um, seriously, and if I'm going to be asked to vote on the things that are being presented to us, I mean, then I definitely want to make sure that all of the establishments are being treated in the, the same in terms of the expectations as to what they show us, you know, so that's all. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Diggins, and I think some of these conversations probably best to take place offline. I will note that one of the things that we do is we look to other departments, whether yeah. it's Board of Health, whether it's the yeah. police or fire, 
Um, and so they're reviewing things too. And, yeah. and, but that's a good question as far as what we're getting. But we look to them to raise issues yeah. on, on various policies. And you'll remember for the store up at, up at the Heights, that did come out of a series of inspections. Yeah. Then it came back to us yeah. on that. But th thank you for that. I know on this application, this was a very detailed, I, I saw a couple mm -hmm. of plans oh, there that I, I hadn't seen anywhere before. Yeah. Well, I know which yeah. one you're yeah. talking about. And, yeah, yeah. Okay. But anyway, um, so, but, but point well taken. Um, all right, so that. And, and if I could just. Sure. Um, for uh, Acting Town Council and, and Ms. Marr, I think the two discrepancies are with the fire department report with 189 Mass Ave and inspectional services. Um, that's the only two places I caught it. But, thank you. And Mr. Dagan's yeah, caught it. Thank you. you. Thank, 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 thank you, Mrs. Mahan. We're all in agreement. This is the old Anthony's East Side Deli site, so whatever yeah. the address is, that's, yeah, that's what should be corrected. Okay. 159. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. How uh, many select board members that take to? to uh, yeah. Uh, okay, moving on to open forum. Except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor a decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three minute time limit to present a concern or a request. Uh, I don't see anybody in the chambers that wishes to speak on open forum. Is there anybody on Zoom? Seeing no hands raised at this time. Okay, that concludes open forum for this evening. Uh, item 16, discussion and approval, zero emission vehicle policy. Talia Fox, sustainability manager. Welcome, Ms. Fox. Thank you. Thank you for the materials that you provided to us. And um, I know you have a presentation. We look forward to, to, to hearing it. Thank you. Talia Fox, sustainability manager. Thank you for your time tonight. I'm here to request the select board's review and approval of a zero emission vehicle first policy. I'll provide a brief presentation on the policy and the broader context of the climate leader communities program requirements. Next slide, please. The zero emission vehicle first policy or ZEV first policy commits the town to prioritize the purchase of zero emission vehicles for our fleet. A zero emission vehicle means a battery electric vehicle, a plug in hybrid or a fuel cell vehicle. The policy utilizes a hierarchy of acceptable vehicle, vehicle types to guide procurement, which I'll explain shortly. Adopting this priority, this policy is a priority in the town's net zero action plan in pursuit of the town's commitment to transition to ZEV purchases by 2030, as stated in the plan, and our broader commitment to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Adopting the policy is also a requ requirement for the town's certification as a climate leader community. Next slide, please. The Climate Leader Communities Program was developed by the State Department of Energy Resources, or DOER, to supplement the Green Communities Program that the town already participates in. The new program focuses on supporting municipal efforts that align more closely with the state's climate goals, like electrification and clean energy. In addition to earning the town recognition, participating in the Climate Leader Communities Program makes us eligible for additional grants on the order of a million dollars as opposed to the current limit of 100,000 that's generally available to us through the Green Communities Competitive Grants. To become a climate leader community, the town must meet five criteria that are listed on this slide by the end of the year. If you go to the next slide, you'll see that we've met three out of the five criteria and we need to meet the two remaining. One is a municipal decarbonization roadmap and the other is the ZEV First policy we're discussing tonight. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna very briefly review the decarbonization roadmap um, item as it's not the focus of the meeting tonight, but we, uh, I will return to the board to discuss it in upcoming months. Um, so the town has already made a commitment that includes municipal operations, so that is facilities and vehicles as part of our net zero goal. And the idea of this municipal decarbonization roadmap is to detail the how, how facilities and vehicles will eliminate fossil fuels by 2050. And the roadmap will do this by identifying more specific implementation measures to achieve both our interim targets and the 2050 target. The town was recently awarded technical assistance funds to complete the roadmap, and I expect that that roadmap will be completed in the coming months. Next slide, please. So the ZEV first policy requires that all departments in town prioritize vehicle replacements following the hierarchy listed on this slide. 
as part of the capital planning process for each vehicle requested that is not a battery electric vehicle, department directors will be asked to justify why purchasing a vehicle of the types higher on the hierarchy would be infeasible. When evaluating what vehicle type will be most appropriate, department directors may consider operational needs, location and duration of replacement vehicles use, availability of charging infrastructure, and other reasonable factors. Next slide, please. The policy would apply to all departments in town, and I want to mention that the school committee has already adopted the policy by reference, so whatever the town adopts, the schools will follow. Light duty vehicles will be required to comply, and vehicles exempt from the policy would be encouraged to comply. Vehicles that are exempt from the policy include off-road vehicles, motorcycles, and heavy duty vehicles like fire trucks, ambulances, and school buses. I also want to mention that in developing the policy draft, which is adapted from the state's model, I have consulted with the DPW director, the fire and police chiefs, the school committee, superintendent of schools, and the town manager. I also presented the policy to all department heads at last month's department heads meeting. Next slide, please. It is true that zero emission vehicles may cost more than their gasoline counterparts, uh, particularly in initial years of the policy's implementation. I will do my very best to pursue all grant options that are available to us, but the funds may not fully offset additional upfront costs. Cost alone is in, an insufficient, insufficient justification for not pursuing a particular zero emission vehicle according to the policy, unless that cost differential is really truly exorbitant as is still the case for many heavy duty vehicles, which is why those vehicles are exempt from the policy. The decarbonization roadmap also will model total cost of ownership for the vehicles, which is typically lower for zero emission vehicles than it is for gas vehicles due to lower maintenance costs and fueling costs. And ideally this would help to justify to the capital planning committee any additional upfront costs that the grants cannot cover. Um, I also understand that undertaking charging infrastructure planning efforts is crucial here. This is a big challenge that we recognize as a barrier right now to complete EV adoption across our fleet, so it's something that we're actively working on. And that will be part of the decarbonization roadmap also that we have technical assistance for. So next slide, please. For next steps, um, tonight I'm requesting that the select board provide any feedback or suggested edits prior to adopting the policy. Regarding enforcement, the plan is to circulate the policy alongside the capital requests memo, and I'm working with the town manager's office to prepare a procurement guidance document with a checklist that walks department directors through the policy compliance and that will need to accompany any request for vehicle funds. That's it for my presentation. Thank you for your time tonight, and I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Thank, thank you very much. I will turn to board members. Mr. Helen. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ms. Fox. Um, I'd like to move approval. And uh, thank you again for the meeting that we had last week that reviewed some of this and I think answered almost all my questions. One that came up for me tonight is kind of a variation of, of the um, acceptability of cost as, as a reason not to do it. I understand the cost of the purchase of the, ve uh, the, purchase of the vehicle um, is not allowed to be a reason for not compliance, but what about the cost of installing charging infrastructure if that were to be prohibited. Is that something that we, I'm not looking for a reason to get out of it, but you know, but also we have to not break the budget too. Right, right. That's and something it, that could be it, considered. Sorry. Yeah, no, please, please. I, I, I the availability of charging infrastructure can be a reason for, for going with, oh. let's say, a hybrid, and that's not a plug-in hybrid, or mm -hmm. for a, um, an ICE vehicle, an internal combustion engine vehicle. So I think in a circumstance where we don't have charging infrastructure already in place, um, it would be reasonable for a department director to, to say, you know, we're unable to, to charge this vehicle in a location that's convenient and so we cannot pursue this particular battery electric vehicle. I do think the town needs to, to put funds toward charging infrastructure, generally speaking. I have found through the charging stations I've already implemented that there is quite a lot of grant funding for that infrastructure right now. Um, through the Make Ready program at Eversource, the utility typically funds all of the um, electrical service upgrades um, and much of the cost of the charging equipment um, is covered. It's, I think, 75% um, or 100% in, in environmental justice block groups. So I think 
It's, it's true that the charging infrastructure is a significant cost, but I, I do believe that we will be able to figure out grant funds for that. There may be some additional costs that we need to put funds toward, but I think it's part of a broader infrastructure planning um, yeah, effort is, is, I guess, what I'd say. And I don't know that department directors are necessarily the only ones who should be thinking about that. So if that's, if that's their main justification, I would request that they speak with me first um, just to learn where we're at in our infrastructure planning efforts. Um, yeah, thank I, you. I, yeah. And I think each vehicle request should be, you know, part of the, the point of this policy is to get people to start thinking and be in communication with me about their plans. And so I, I hope that this will really spur a conversation more than anything. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that thoughtful response. One other question, and it might be for the town manager through you, Mr. Chairman, um, is I think that this is this is a really exciting step if the board takes this tonight. And um, I think this is it's not the first time that in the capital planning process we've had to evaluate. We've had to say that, you know, we may save money over the lifespan of an investment, but that's not going to return to the capital budget necessarily. So, you know, this could be another case where it just extends that and, you know, the, the uh, greater lifespan of a vehicle might eventually, in a way, come back to the capital budget, but reduced maintenance costs probably don't. Um, reduced fuel costs probably doesn't. So, uh, and I welcome any, I'm springing this on you without asking you ahead of time, and I know that your uh, finance director isn't here who works with the capital budget, but if you have any comments now or just, uh, just to take as a, kind of as, as, a, uh, as an observation for me, that uh, you know, I think that will this may, in a positive way, trigger us to th kind of rethink how we do capital, <laughs> uh, because because a lot of these benefits are, are really down the road, and we and we may well see with, uh, despite the considerable talents of of Ms. Fox in getting grants, that that you know the, the purchase price may indeed be higher. So you know how that how that affects us is that if that affects uh, the diff if that makes it more difficult to purchase things up front, um, you know. I, Welcome. Any thoughts you may have on that? Mr. Feeney. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. In fact, the most substantive uh, issue that we might face is that higher upfront cost, as you alluded to. However, it's already something that we are working towards and considering, and Ms. Fox could also speak to this, but we will be eligible for a certain number of rebates as well as what's called the IRS direct pay option that would be around the town. The, around the time at the end of the year, though we are not a taxpayer per se, that we would be able to issue a filing and get a direct pay option. So what we're looking into is the appropriate accounting mechanism, likely via some sort of revolving fund, whereby we could get uh, those rebates that we get through more EV trucks or the mass EVIP program or from the direct pay option to deposit them in a revolving fund that then becomes a source of revenue for the capital planning committee to tap for the next round of vehicles. Because really it's that you, you need to, to front load the full cost of the vehicle and that would necessarily need to be cap, uh, carried in the capital plan, but nothing would preclude us from trying to pursue uh, making those funds available to feed forward in the mechanism of purchasing future EV vehicles to, to an extent, hold harmless the capital plan from the increased upfront cost. I'm glad I asked. Thank you. Uh, the final thing I would say, Mr. Chair, is just, um, you know, once again, I'm really grateful to the community for being very clear with its leaders, both elected and appointed, that this, that uh, moving towards carbon-free future is a high priority the community. I continually hear a lot from residents about that. And I want to not only be express gratitude to my colleagues, to our staff, to our officials, but also to the voters for telling us that that's what you want us to do. Because I think that important steps like this are the result of an engaged community in the political process. So I am grateful to the town yet again uh, for steps like this. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mr. Hurd. Thank you. Uh, second. Me and motion. I did. Mm -hmm. Approval? Yeah. Yeah. I'll second the motion. It's been a while. Um, thank you. I also had an opportunity to sit with Ms. Vox last week, and she answered all my questions. I think this, I am very happy to see this plan. I think it achieves our goals that have been set forth by town staff and by our community as a whole, um, but also recognizes certain limitations in the way we implement those goals right now and I would as I mentioned I think in a few years 
we'll see a plan that's a lot stricter. And we would anticipate that as the market provides more opportunities for fully electric vehicles to replace certain vehicles that we thought, you know, would never be electric. And I am happy to see what manufacturers can come up with for those um, and in an affordable way. But again, I think this is a very good step in the right direction that again recognizes the current climate and we, I look forward to implementing this and then seeing what we can do in the future. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mrs. Mann? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I didn't avail myself of the opportunity to meet with you. So not, I apologize for, for that. Um, and I, I do appreciate because there's an awful lot of work that goes on um, that saves people watching this at home at time. Um, and the only comment I would make um, and through you, Mr. Chair, either to Ms. Fox or to, and or the town manager is um, so, touching on what Mr. Helmuth also was talking about regarding the um, charging infrastructure planning, and I understand there are grants out there like Make Ready and, and, and some others, but watching, um, I did some research on other municipalities that are engaging in this process um, around the charging infrastructure planning, um, and one of the perhaps pitfalls that I see is um, I understand right now you're coming before the policymakers on the town and school side with a net zero plan, but moving forward, um, am I correct to assume that um, obviously Mr. Rademacher will be involved um, in the infrastructure planning process and or I'm assuming that um, the fire chief or someone from fire safety will be involved in that because one of the few um, pitfalls that I've seen of municipalities, and this is something that's brand new and people are, are going along the way, is um, I was reading a trade magazine that said, you know, don't fall into the pitfall of designing your charging infrastructure um, facilities around grants um, that are available for pieces of equipment that may not be exactly what um, you need. And then um, just talking with IAFFF and others, I think it's really important, and I'm not saying this isn't a piece that hasn't happened and won't continue to happen, but to also have somebody from fire services um, involved in that process that once we know what the fleet initially is going um, to look like and where the stations are, making sure that we're customizing it um, appropriately for the town of Arlington and whatever those vehicles are, especially around fire safety, um, because I won't go into it, but I saw two municipalities that got a grant for something and it's, I don't think they'll ever actually use it. So, um, and I know now you have to do the policy maker sort of work on this to get us to um, get the fourth of the five steps that need to be done. But my long question, which is now short, is am I correct to assume that when, as we move forward with the charging infrastructure planning um, process, that the DPW director, as well as either the fire chief or somebody else, and even if it's inspectional services, will be involved in that to make sure we're designing what's appropriate for the town of Arlington and its fleet? Sure. Uh, Mr. Feeney? I have to say, of course, we can commit to that. In fact, we are already underway in discussions with talking to exactly those folks for some level two charging infrastructure that we are slated to put in uh, as part of the conclusion of the DPW project. So involving both, uh, you know, like Rademacher, as you mentioned, but also inspectional services as well to make sure we're meeting our code requirements is paramount. Thank you. And the fire side in terms of if there is something that does happen, we have what's appropriate at the charging station. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hey, so we met over email because I was all in on this meeting. I was, easy, I was an easy sell on this meeting because I, I'm totally in favor of this meeting. And when it comes to charging infrastructure, I mean, I, mean, I certainly <laughs> charge us to do 
more of that. And as Mrs. Mihan uh, kind of indicated, we, we should kind of determine what we want to do, get as much as we can through grants, I mean, but then be, be willing you know, to, to pay for what, what we want. Because I mean, I mean, I think on the policy side, we will probably have to I mean, adapt our parking policy. And it can have, certainly have I mean, some implications for housing in a very positive way. You know, and I could go into that, uh, but I won't tonight. It, uh, 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 so, so yeah, ultimately, I mean, uh, the, the risk the, the, the payoff is in the reduction in risk. Um, that's where the capital, the big capital payoff is. I mean, so we, we reduce the chances that we're going to have a, a disastrous event, you know, that will take out I mean, facilities that will then have some really big capital costs. I mean, and if not for us, you know, then for, I mean, uh, our region, our state, our country, our planet, because we really do need to do things differently. And it's going to cost us uh, to do it, you know, I mean, so, so we're all in favor of, of I mean, trying to, um, hopefully reverse the situation and certainly stop the deterioration. And, and so I'm, I'm really happy you know, that um, we're going down this road and that we have someone and like you leading us um, um, down the, the, the path, the correct path. I mean, so, so um, oh, so after all our back and forth, I do have one little question. It, uh, 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 so why aren't motorcycles included? Hmm. That's a great question. I was actually just thinking that I was, as I was reviewing this yeah, today. Yeah. Um, I think it probably has to do with the technology right. and where where the technology is, but uh, admittedly, that was part of the uh, state's model policy, and it's it's something worth questioning. Yeah, um, just, yeah. It's something worth questioning. Yeah. I wish I had a better answer. That's okay. Um, That's fine. But yeah, I okay. suspect it has to do with where the technology yeah. is um, at this moment. Yeah. Okay. But it is sort of a surprising surprising vehicle to be exempt because there are certainly electric bikes left and right. So. Yeah, yeah, like everything, really. It's like, okay, all right, that's all. Yes. Thank you. There's probably a history there from okay. DOER I can look into. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Feeney? If I could, I would just add a reminder that though exempt, they are still encouraged yeah. uh, to comply. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Just a couple of comments. I also support this, and Ms. Fox, thank you for the, the time as, as recently as this morning answering some of my final questions on this. And I, and I know that this has really been a continuum, as Mr. Hamlet has talked about, what we've done as a town, what we've done as a board. And uh, back in 2021, in August of 2021, we endorsed the Zero Action Plan. And as Ms. Fox said, um, referenced that uh, having a zero emission municipal fleet by 2030 is actually a high priority of that plan. So it's nice to see us fall along here. The other thing, it's, it's somewhat sobering, is looking at the statistics that are cited in 2021 as to the state of uh, climate change. And, and when you look since then, 2023 was the hottest year in record. We will probably break that this year. So we really need to uh, you know, do what we can as a, as, as a community. And, and um, I think this is, is well thought out. It, it's, it's been discussed for a long time, even going back to 2018 when Mrs. Mahan and Mr. Hurd created the Clean Energy Future Committee with, with their other uh, members of the board at that time. Um, just a question, a follow-up on infrastructure, because it is something that strikes me here from 2021. At, when this report was issued, the, the Zero Action Plan, there were four electric charging vehicle stations in Arlington. Do you know how many there are now? I, I, just, I, th I, I don't think it's grown that much. I think it just shows the need for infrastructure investments on, on that. I didn't mean to check you with that, that question, but I think that's something that really we'll need to keep up as we, uh, as we go yeah. forward. So there are eight public charging stations now. Um, so each station has two ports. Okay. We also, that, so that's just the public stations. Yeah, that's right, yeah, as opposed to municipal. Several, yeah, we have several other um, municipal charging stations. Uh, I actually don't have the number off the top of my head. Okay. Yeah, but and that, that was more referencing for the yeah. public, but just again, if, if we are going to be transitioning, that the infrastructure investments need to be made. And then one other thing that we spoke about earlier today is just the need to maintain a, a vehicle inventory as we go forward in terms of um, as cars are being replaced. And I know um, this is perhaps a comment for the town manager as well. I know there are a number of different departments for various reasons, whether it's insurance, whether it's for financial reporting, that probably have an obligation to compile vehicles. And, and I know, Ms. Fox, you, you're going to have your own obligation. It'd be great just to try to streamline that process so that people aren't recreating um, a lot of effort to, to identify those vehicles. Um, so with that, 
a few comments. Very excited about this, and thank you for, for all the work. On a motion by, for approval by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you for joining us tonight. Item 17 now is for approval, a no parking here to corner sign on Alfred Road at Lake Street. I believe the materials were attached to the agenda item. I don't, we just have the letter. Mr. Feeney, you're going to pre present on this, okay? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, before the board this evening is a fairly simple request that came in through our uh, traffic safety form that was then funneled to our internal traffic and safety uh, working group, it made it to a recent meeting agenda where we assigned, uh, you know, where folks take responsibility for making certain field observations and measurements. Uh, in this instance, Officer Corey Rateau, uh, whom we all know from our traffic details and licensing unit, made a series of field observations where, whereby he substantiated the claim of the uh, abutting resident in terms of parking uh, too close uh, to the corner of Lake Street on Alfred Road that created uh, certain visibility concerns. Of course, uh, as folks are likely aware, there is a 20-foot uh, minimum state requirement, but in the instance of Alfred Road with uh, the radius of the intersection as well as the existing placement of uh, the marked crossing, uh, you know, Officer Rateau, uh, you know, used a wheel and made measurements for what would be the appropriate location uh, of those signs. And as such, it was not simply a matter of putting up a sign in accordance with the state law, which we would have the purview to do with staff. But in fact, the proper placement of the sign required it to be placed further back from the intersection and therefore would require a commensurate change to the traffic rules and orders which is outlined in Officer Rateau's memo and before the board this evening for consideration. So we are seeking, uh, obviously, favorable action for uh, the placement of these signs in the location detailed by Officer Rateau and uh, with a vote to amend the Schedule 1 of our traffic rules and orders uh, accordingly. Great. Thank you, Mr. Feeney. Uh, Mr. Hurd? Move approval. Second. Okay, second from Mr. Diggins. Any comments? Um, uh, Mr. Diggins. So, so, uh, so I'm, I'm looking at it, and so, it, look, I, I'm fine with it, you know. Uh, I guess the question is, and, and we've kind of talked about this, um, um, Mr. Um, Feeney, do you think there are other, other areas that could benefit I mean, from such a change? Uh, Thank you, you, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, sure, Mr. Feeney. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. I, I'm sure that is the case, though I will admit this, uh, you know, this referral was evaluated on its own merits and uh, other instances would require their own uh, site review, observation, and analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Diggins. Uh, okay, so and a motion for approval by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Diggins. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. It is approved, uh, and that concludes our agenda items. I, oh, yeah. Um, why don't we check to see if um, item 13, Ms. Goodrich, is with us. No. Okay, so we'll have to schedule that for, for our next meeting in July. Okay. Okay, and um, I will move on to, to new business, if anybody has any. Ms. Meyer? New business. Thank you. Hey, Ms. Munson, first of all, we didn't get a chance to hear from you this evening. That's Deputy okay. Town Council Jacqueline Munson is with us this evening. Any new business? No new business. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Feeney? Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. A few uh, items for new business. Uh, first, I would like to take the opportunity to thank our uh, public works, especially our forestry division, as well as the town's tree contractor, uh, Marquee Tree, for their outstanding efforts may recall we had something that almost resembled a microburst hit town uh, about a week and a half ago, uh, two Fridays ago, and it required a significant level of effort with crews uh, staying until uh, 3 a.m. Saturday morning after starting shortly after lunch uh, on Friday to remove a number of downed trees from roadways, clean up limbs. Uh, you know, the storm had pretty broad-based impact across the community and 
uh, required cleanup the following Saturday, and then we were uh, back at it uh, last week again, still getting uh, less pressing limbs and uh, you know downed materials that were not presenting a risk. So you know our folks worked hard and in short order uh, sort of returned things to normal. So I wanted to uh, extend my thanks and, and kudos to those folks. And then uh, uh, similarly in uh, good news, this afternoon shortly after the close of town hall business, the attorney general's office issued rulings on uh, our MBTA communities related warrant articles, both from uh, the special town meeting in the fall and the annual town meeting this spring. Uh, and we are uh, now finally fully approved, which is uh, just outstanding news. All uh, claims with respect to procedural deflect, defects have been uh, waived and there was some uh, minor recommendations for things we may consider clarifying at a uh, future legislative session with respect to the other items in our zoning bylaw as they relate to our MBTA communities uh, districts, but uh, all in all, you know, the rulings will be, I think they already are public, but they are uh, good news for the town in solidifying our position with being uh, MBTA uh, communities compliant. Great, great news. Thank you, Mr. Feeney. Uh, Mr. Diggins? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, so this may be something for us to take up at our next meeting, and partly because I forgot to bring it up I mean, when we discussed the last item. Um, with respect to amending I mean, um, the um, traffic rules in order, you know, you know, I think it'd be good you know, as a practice I mean, for us to actually have I me mean, that amended uh, traffic rule in order presented I mean, at the next board meeting for us to, to sign off on it, mainly to make sure that it happens, you know, uh, because I think it, uh, we've had another case, I me mean, where um, um, with some other changes, I me mean, where uh, we've kind of lost track, I mean, and I think it's easy to lose track, you know. Um, and I think it's good that if this board I mean, makes a change, I mean, that the board then sees the change, and we may not have to vote on it; it can be put on the consent agenda. Uh, but, but at least to just kind of its procedure, I mean, so that um, it's just perfunctory almost I mean, that we do it. So I just want to bring that up as a suggestion at this point, and we can consider it, I mean, um, um, hopefully at another board meeting, or maybe at um, uh, our will setting session. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mrs. Moran? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd definitely be interested in that. I know previously, Lieutenant Hughes, whenever we made these changes, would make sure they're incorporated in our traffic rules and orders. And I'm assuming that's what um, Officer Oto has taken on that responsibility, but we haven't actually delineated that that's the case. So uh, at the goals meetings or wherever, um, just as, as Mr. Diggins says, to make sure those are, are going in. Um, my two um, new business, uh, the first one is, since our town manager, this is your first cycle with um, different processes in the town, although I feel like you've been here for many, many years. Um, traditionally in the past, um, for our audit through Powers and Sullivan, um, as we all know, they uh, come in around July, August, um, to initiate that part of the process. And I've had a very quick pull to the side of the road conversation with the town manager, Mr. Feeney. Um, traditionally in the past, what other town managers have done is, um, my first for new business is to find out if we're continuing on um, through Mr. Feeney, if he wants to continue on with past practice, as well as does Power and Sullivan want to continue on with past practice in light of the fact that um, I believe they've been purchased um, by another group and they may have, you know, different ways, state of the art in terms of how they conduct business. And what has been done in the past with previous town managers is usually by June to the end of June, um, when we know Powers and Sullivan are coming in in July and August, uh, the uh, town manager, uh, in concert with the superintendent of schools, would give to Powers and Sullivan two or three areas. They look at everything and make uh, suggestions, corrections, et cetera, but in the past what has been done is two or three areas have been focused, have been given to, one year it was, um, 
athletic fees down at the high school. Um, so for my new businesses, I would like to know from uh, the town manager if he and Powers and Sullivan, are, if that's going to be uh, the current practice and if that's the case, if any of us, which I certainly have one, um, but I don't want to do it here at a meeting, um, if it's going to be that the manager and Powers and Sullivan want to continue with that practice of highlighting two to three different areas on the town and or school side, then we should make that known um, to Mr. Feeney by the end of June, or if for some reason there's a different process in light of Mr. Feeney as well as the new group. It's still Powers and Sullivan, but it's sort of new management. So, um, and I'll leave it at that, but I definitely want to give my, and regardless, all of us have strong personalities. We're going to give our opinion to the town manager in terms of what we think the Powers and Sullivan audit should look like, but, um, but you need to let us know what works best for you and the, and the new group of people at Powers and Sullivan. And then the second um, new business is, and I keep meaning to go by this area, and I'm, I'm gonna do it tomorrow, um, but I just wanted to ask the town manager if he could ask uh, through to Mr. Rodemacher, perhaps uh, there was a another crash, I think there was two in the past year, 18 months, no serious injuries, at Churchill and Wildwood, and there was an individual, and I'll forward you the email, it was on a public list, but he didn't ask me to do this, so I you know, don't necessarily want to say his name, but saying that perhaps the cause of the accident was something that he claims he's reported um, that a town tree at Churchill and Wildwood, if someone could look at that corner and see, is there a town tree that somehow is blocking that stop sign that nobody sees it, and there may have unfortunately been accidents. And I am going to go out there myself tomorrow um, just to look at it. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to acknowledge and thank everyone who made the um, annual Pride Celebration at Town Hall a real success last Saturday. I was pleased to see you there. I was pleased to see you there, Mr. Chair, as well, and with our spouses. And uh, we had school committee members, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey was there, and, um, and Laurel Gittleson and town departments. We had a great showing from Zero Waste Arlington and Charlotte Milan from, from DPW, which was a really busy booth. So there's a surprisingly wonderful overlap there. <laughs> uh, Director Litton was there from the library. Yes. Uh, and we had some, um, some terrific community organizations there. So it was just a really great fest of joyous times that always is. And uh, I'm aware of just how much work went into it on the part of the Rainbow Commission, but also supported by town staff. Thanks to all who made that a great, great event. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Oh, I didn't have any business, but then Mr. Mahan just reminded me of something that I'm always like, I gotta bring that up. So I might as well bring it up now. There is actually a stop sign that I drive on Hillside, where Hillside crosses Florence. I actually brought, brought this up to Adam a few years ago. And there's a town tree that literally you can't, and it's often you come up to the stop sign. So maybe we need an inventory of <laughs> town trees that are blocking stop signs, but. Hillside and Florence. I have seen that one, and that one is pretty bad. Um, and I just, I get, you, I'll use this opportunity as a baseball coach and baseball parent just to say it's all star season, and this is when we invite some other communities to come play in Arlington. So I do want to just thank the DPW for getting out there and making our fields look nice. Um, unfortunately, our marquee field hasn't been available for. A little longer than we had wanted it to not be available due to the resurfacing of the parking lot in the rink, but I believe that is complete now. Um, but again, thank you for all the work that they do that's kind of sight unseen. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. And, and just uh, briefly, just really for members' uh, benefit, I, Mr. Feeney and I spoke about potential dates for the. Um, goal session and we're looking the week of August 5th will either be and and I'll coordinate through Ms. Marr to contact members if there's any concerns on nights that week but it's the 5th is Monday the 8th is Thursday just because of the, it being the longer day that probably is the dates that are going to be proposed but we'll announce that at our July meeting uh, on July 22nd and that's that's all I had so uh, with that I'll take a motion to adjourn so moved second Okay, a motion by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. 
ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.